I like liquid fertilizers because you can get a way higher efficiency or uptake out of them than you can dry. Okay, for one thing is a lot of dry fertilizers break down too slow for the plant's diet. They just don't release fast enough. Okay, so I buy it, I put it out, it ties up, or it doesn't break down and it's not available and the plant goes, oh, skip it, just move on, cut the yield. The liquid fertilizers, we can stabilize them so that they'll stay under the plant for one, two, three months and not go away. They'll stay in a soluble form and the plant can take them up as they need them. They have an extended soluble diet. That's optimum for the plant. So when we grow potatoes, we can develop two or three or four times the root system. Instead of having four or five tubers, we'll have 15 or 20. And all we did was we had a liquid available stabilized nutrient program versus a dry that couldn't release fast enough, couldn't do it. So the plant says, well, I got more to work with here and I got less to work with here. And we see that all the time on the plant production. You'll also see it on your root size. If you don't have big old roots, your phosphate is not happening. So Abe, what did we do on your corn last year? Did, did we have difference in root sizes? Yes. So where did the little roots come from? Where did the big roots come from? Well, we did treat the seed and we uh, stabilized the fertilizer when we put it down the starter. Okay, and the starter was phosphate. And so when you guys dug up those plants, was it your, your co-op guys or your agronomists? That yeah, it was the agronomist that dug it up. And what did she think about the roots? Well, it was pretty obvious that we had bigger roots on the treated stuff than we did on the untreated. Yeah. Okay, all we did was had a better nutrient program going to the plant. The plant knew what to do with it. And so, a Going from a uh, three and a half to four ton per acre silage, we went to a seven. And we didn't even apply any fertilizer after plant. There was a generous amount of uh, nitrogen in the soil because they were manure fields. Mm -hmm. But by stabilizing the phosphate, putting on the nitrogen fixers, the phosphate fixers, and putting the seed treatment on there, they about doubled their silage production. We spent less money doing it, had a better crop. So all we did was just change a few things so that the plant got more nutrition. Okay, so when we say, okay, how are we going to get to 60 or 80 or 100 bushel wheat? We have to make sure that what we're putting underneath that plant is there when it needs to be and it stays there. Now, sometimes on nitrogen, because you can't hold it, what we have to do is apply it several times. And you go, dang, I can't watch cartoons. I got to go out and run the dang sprayer over the plant field again. It's a pain in the butt. All right. And sometimes it is because we're tending a plant that has a continuous diet. All right. So if you guys are plants, how would you like to get fed at Thanksgiving and Easter? That'd be good? So you only get two meals a year. You get a whole slew of turkey at Thanksgiving time, and then you get a whole bunch of ham at Easter time. You go, your wife says, that's good enough. Kick butt all year. That's what we do to our plants. We give them a dump in the fall and a dump in the spring and say, you guys figure it out. You put it through blood like Oh. It's too black and white if you put it like that. I, I'm sorry I sugarcoated that. <laughs> okay? So th that's the problem is, is plants are these cool little things that need nutri this, this continuous nutrition. And the better we manage that, the more they'll give us back. And so, yeah, it is more work than we're sometimes accustomed to doing. But we at least have an option to not have low yields.
but it's going to take more effort. And so, as long as we know what we're doing and we're not wasting the effort, then it pays back. We can do that. And, and I like liquids because, because they are available and we can stabilize those guys. And that gives the plant that edge. Because dries, it's difficult to do. I mean, some guys have to change and get set up for liquids. But if you can produce 20 or 30 more bushel an acre at a lower price because you're buying less units to waste and more to use, that's a lot of money because you guys aren't farming 12 acres. You're farming 12,000 acres. So you know which, which end stabilizer is good. The end stabilizers that kill biology are bad. The end stabilizers that don't kill the biology but keep the end intact, Nutrisphere is one of them. Okay. Okay, that's a good one. Nitrogen doesn't tie up with much. That's the problem with keeping it is when we put out 38% or 22, 28% or 32%, nitrogen is a single charge. It just doesn't go get very attracted to anything. That's why we lose it so quick. So we're not going to, we, we want the plant to utilize the nitrogen because we're not going to hang it up in the soil and keep it available very well. We don't want it releasing too fast. We don't want it releasing too slow. How about Nutrisphere for a putting on the fertilizer. Yeah, in a nitrogen it's the way to go. You can stabilize it with that. It will slow its release and you'll see way more response with Nutrisphere than you will your toxins, your Agritame, your Limus, and those other things. Yeah? So is it true that uh, you don't lose N like in the winter after the soil gets down to a certain temperature? Well, y you no, no, the, the temperature doesn't make it go away. It's, it's all your winter moisture that moves it. I'm very much against putting out any nitrogen in the fall for the next year's crop. That is like, who's got a hundred dollar bill because I got a cigarette lighter? I mean, that is a no-no. It's great for the co-op because, hey, we can spread nitrogen all fall. But it's not going to be there come spring. What if you spread it then till it down? Yeah, with the drip. Uh, as great, until we get a little bit of rain and a little bit of snow and a little bit of spring melt and a little bit of water, because your nitrogen will go where the water but goes. When, when we put nitrogen out six months before we need it, what are the chances that you can drop $100 bill in the ghetto and come back and find them six months later? Slim and Slim just left town. Slim just left town. And so you have no hundred dollar bills left because you have six months of risk that's going to do nothing but diminish your nitrogen potential. And, and if we have a perfect fall, no moisture, we come back, we get no leaching, it will still be there. Unless you have lots of bacteria out there and it's warm, and they go, huh, check out this menu. I just got all this nitrogen dumped on me, and I got some root systems over here. I think I'm gonna have me a nitrogen fest until the soil gets so cold, I can't function anymore. And what I will tell you, because your microbes are so mobile and so fast, they will eat everything before your plant has a chance, because there's only Three problems with plants. They can't move, they can't run, and they can't hide. So, they can't go get the nitrogen, but your biology can. And when you put nitrogen out there, you go out and dump 32% bunch of urea, and you do a biology test before and after, and you will spike your bacteria populations 10 to 20 fold. So what did they just do? They ate your nitrogen. Your plant ain't going to get it. It's not going to be there. Now, if you said, aha, I'll get you little buggers, and I come back and put a whole bunch of protozoa in come spring, and I put a whole bunch of protozoa in that soil that comes back and eats those bacteria that just hogged up all your winter nitrogen, and you turn it back into NH4, now you go, ha ha, 
I just fixed you. I got my nitrogen back and you're dead. What temperature do the, do the uh, nitrogen fixers or consumers stop working? They're, they're pretty good into the high, you know, 50s. So, like, so December. They're dormant. They're, they're, they're going to cool off. It's going to go dormant. So I went out in December. I knocked a bunch of ground down, a little bunch of urea on, and covered it up. I'm not, I don't have to worry about that, do I? Not too much because you don't Except have for spring. We don't know what's going to happen in the spring. Exactly. We still have spring exposure, and so that's what I say is we have these risk factors that we don't necessarily have to inherit. Because I usually like putting stuff on when I need it because I've got all of these little things out there that are going, you know what, I think I could enjoy a little of that. I could leach it out. I can digest it. I can tie it up. I can do something with it. And it's just, it doesn't get better. It can only get worse. And so if we can apply a little closer, it just increases. If I spend a dollar, I'm going to get more out of it. Run over. That's all. Your squash won't get run over. Your corn, wheat, barley, you won't get any disease in them. Now, you've got to have a balance of other nutrition there. I mean, the whole thing with Kinsey is get the right adequate nutrition, but get the minerals in the right ratios so that you prevent all of these diseases and symptoms. If my copper is perfect and everything else is in the tank, not going to work. So we got to address a little bit of all of them, yeah. So if you go liquid foliar for a, for a seed, for a starter, and you put the micro 5-5 in, that's got all, all five of them, that don't Yeah, it? yeah. It's got high manganese, copper, zinc, boron. So what kind of level are we getting with a pound? Uh, it, it, it's not going to affect your soil levels. It'll affect your plant levels. Yeah, the plant level. Yeah, it, it's really great for plants. You can see a huge response from that because you're putting it right with the seed in furrow, and it's the plants are going to have really good access to sure. that. And so the other thing is, is if you you can take a mineral, a soil mineral, and broadcast it, but if you band it, you're increasing its efficiency two and three times because everything is right here where the seed goes everywhere. versus everywhere where your roots aren't going to go. So last year we banded some, we do a fair bit of banding of dry stuff like we'll band soft rock phosphate because we can put down phosphate, calcium, a lot of trace minerals and instead of putting out 250 pounds an acre we can put down 100 pounds an acre and it's the same as broadcasting 250 or 300 pounds. And so th the other thing about foliar fertilizers, let me just tell you that really briefly, is most companies do this wrong because it's cheap. Okay, so oftentimes in a foliar they'll put a little boron, a little iron, maybe a little manganese, a little copper, a little zinc, okay? So you've got potentially up here five different minerals. Okay, now every one of these minerals has a different molecular structure. Right? We have different number of atoms, different number of neutrons, different number of electrons. Okay? But then they'll come back and use one chelator. Okay? It may be an E, D, T, A, or some type of synthetic chelator. And what it does is it's tries to hold these guys from binding up with each other. Okay? Because remember, when we go back to the plant, if my compounds get too big, my plant can't take them up. Not through the root, not through the leaf. So I gotta keep these guys apart. I gotta keep them from tying up. Well, this is the problem. What's the number of, of, of the, it will take it up? What's the? We have to stay at 700 atoms or less. Okay, it's the same through your skin, same through your gut membrane, same through your, the root systems, same through the leaf. We have to have very small structures, okay? And so what happens is by the time you start adding the molecular structure of boron, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, you throw a little molybdenum in there, I'm already over my 700. 
So I want my minerals to get into my plants. The problem with these synthetic chelators like this is they're already well over a thousand. So when they hook all these minerals on top of this, they ain't going in your plant. Now it's cheap to do it this way, but when you look at your foliars and they've got EDTA on them, or those types of chelators, they're not functional. And these chelators will work better with one mineral than the others, because all these minerals are not the same. It will pick out a favorite, and those, the rest of these guys aren't as chelated. They're not as balanced. So the other thing is, when these guys are made synthetically, which this is, it is toxic to the plant. So, when we make a foiler, when Salam makes a foiler, I don't do this. He does this. Molybdenum, cobalt, whatever we're putting in, nickel, whatever's got to go in that plant, every single element has its own chelator. So if we have eight minerals, we have eight separate chelators so that this organic chelator and this mineral are never more than two or three hundred in size. So when they hit a plant leaf surface, they go right in. And because they're organic, these organic chelators, the plant uses them as nutrition, not as a toxin. That's the right way to do a foliar. Most companies won't go to that work and they won't go to that expense. Oftentimes your chelators down here are more expensive than your minerals. But that's why the properly made foliar works better. Okay? You want these foliars to get into the plant and get working very, very quickly. Okay, so I think we just did all this whole thing. Can you mix some of those micros with uh, herbicides? Yeah, because, because these are already fully chelated. They don't have a charge. Okay. See, in the Midwest, they'll tell you, absolutely emphatically, do not mix glyphosate with trace minerals. Because glyphosate is negative, your trace minerals are positive, you get mud in your tank, yeah. glyphosate doesn't work, you got a mess, no one's happy. And so our stuff, when our individual, and really what we're doing is we're taking a positive and we're putting a negative with it. So anytime we have a positive, we match it with a negative, we end up with a zero charge on the backside. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to attract, it's not going to bond. It's just going to go in. And so that's the right way to put this stuff together. When you neutralize these charges, then the plant can take them up because they're not all hooked together. Okay, yes sir? So technically, it could grow if the soil samples or the tissue samples required, you could throw all these in the tank and be just great. It, it, you can, yeah. These guys that put these together are putting these minerals, they're dissolving them, they're putting the chelators on them, and they're putting them in a tank, and they don't tie up, they don't complex, and they work. But you have to be a little bit better at chemistry, and, and it's a little bit more work, and it's a little bit more expense, but when you, have, when you have almost everything you put on the leaf go into the plant and work really well, it, it's way, the efficiency just goes way up. You're not wasting your money. Because, remember, with my trace minerals, I'm trying to activate my systems and get this stuff to happen. 